Welcome back to the Harder Unbox News Corner. In a bit of a different time slot this week, we've recently been experimenting a little bit with optimizing when we release our videos, which is why you would have seen over, I think, the past couple of days, uh, we've been releasing at different times. Uh, so from our channel data, it seems that more people are awake at this time than some other times. So we're giving it a bit of a try. Should be a bit better for you guys in the US and Europe rather than having our videos go live during the middle of the night, as it turns out. We don't know exactly how the YouTube algorithm works. I don't think really anyone does, but uh, yeah, we're always looking to optimize around here. Probably gonna stick with this time slot for a while. So mark the new schedule down in your brains or just use the handy bell icon to get notified when our videos are published. If you wanna be one of the first people to comment and all that sort of thing. Anyway, enough about the channel. Let's get into the real hardware news of the week. The first story is a little different than some of the usual stuff we cover in News Corner, but I thought it would be a super interesting look uh, for some people that like a closer look at the hardware that we use on a daily basis. We're gonna be looking at this image, which is of an AMD Epic 7702 engineering sample that's been delittered and then photographed using an infrared camera. It gives us a neat look at what is inside the massive IO die that's found on this CPU. So first up, bit of a background here. The Epic 7702 is one of AMD's 64 core second gen options, so a Rome CPU using the Zen 2 architecture. It's not the flagship model, that's either the 7742 or 7H12, depending on how you classify it, but with a 200 watt TDP, 2 gigahertz base clock, and 3.35 gigahertz boost clock, along with a price tag of $6,450, it's certainly a very high end server model from AMD. As this is a 64 core model, all eight chiplets are fully populated with eight working cores. And then of course we have the IO die. You can see this infrared photo hasn't revealed the innards of the chiplets, although we'll look at those in a moment, but due to a slight infrared translucency with the IO die, we can get a nice look at the block layout here. Let's zoom in a bit on that IO die with this enlarged photo. 8.34 billion transistors here in a 416 square millimeter die, just a huge beast of a chip. At either end here, you can see the DDR4 channels. There are quite clearly eight of them, one per lane of memory we get with Epic CPUs. These eight blocks here, four on the top and four on the bottom, appear to be the infinity fabric links to the chiplets. You can see they are placed as close as possible to the locations of the chiplets for high-speed interconnects. It's crucial to reduce the distance over which the signals communicate. So these are positioned specifically here to give the shortest path to where AMD has placed the chiplets. On the wider image, you can see how this plays out. They are directly opposite the chiplet locations. These longer sections in the middle at the top and bottom are likely the PCIe connections, four on each side for a total of eight, meaning each block should have 16 lanes. Epic have a total of 128 PCIe Gen 4 lanes per CPU, so that's how the math adds up. There's possibly another PCIe connection down here for something, and then there are several other blocks you can see, such as these on the top and bottom of the right side. As for what's in the middle, unsure of that, possibly some form of connecting everything together, given there is so much I.O. packed into this one die, having some way of sorting it all out is possibly required, although if you do know exactly what these sections are used for, if you're a bit more of an expert than I am, would love to hear about that in the comments below. You can see in this picture how AMD has cut down the I.O. die from Epic to the what they're using for the AM4 Ryzen processors. I believe this is an earlier shot that was taken of the Ryzen 5 36 Again, we see two DDR4 channels at the top. On the right side, we have two Infinity Fabric links for connecting to the two chiplets, again, in an optimal location. And then on the other side, we have two 16 lane banks of PCIe connectivity. At least that's what it looks like, although for Ryzen, this is limited to 24 lanes. From this Ryzen shot, we also get a look inside the chiplet, which is the same design for Epic. The outer four blocks are the cores, with each block having two cores. The center sections are the L3 cache, while this strip in the center is the Infinity Fabric interconnect. You can see the two CCX split here as well, with the top half and bottom halves, each being a CCX with cores on each end. This is pretty similar to first gen Zen designs, but with a different and more optimized layout for lower latencies. I always find these sorts of things super interesting, so I hope you guys like this sort of stuff as well just goes to show the marvels of seven nanometer manufacturing to fit so much into such a small package moving on now according to a report from computer bases translated into german 
really should brush up on my German. There's quite a few good quality German tech sites out there. Anyway, according to Computerbase, the upcoming AMD Agisa version 1.0.0.4 for Zen 2 processors might deliver a slight improvement to all core frequencies. They managed to get access to some beta BIOSes that use 1.0.0.4 specifically for their ASRock Vitality X470 gaming K4 motherboard. When that motherboard was paired with an AMD Ryzen 7 3800X, Computerbase saw an improvement in all core frequencies from 4.245 GHz with Agisa 1.0.0.3 ABBA up to 4.325 GHz with 1.0.0.4. They said a 50 MHz increase. With those numbers, it's more like an 80 MHz increase. Not sure which of those numbers is right, but should be somewhere around there. At best, this is just under a 2% gain to all core frequencies, although there was no improvement to single core turbos. It's also just one test case with one motherboard. Who knows whether this was just the case with this one board, perhaps the Fatality X470 Gaming K4 was running slightly below what it should have been, and this update brings it back to normal. We have seen that sort of thing happen with past Agisa updates where we get improvements to some boards and not others. I wouldn't go saying that Agisa 1.0.0.4 will definitely improve clock speeds for all Ryzen owners, but it has happened for this one test case, so there's a bit of hope, not that a 2% improvement will make a drastic difference to performance, so that's certainly not a bad thing. Also should be noted that Computer Base's beta BIOSes didn't have new SMU firmware which is expected to land alongside a GSA 1.0.0.4 when it becomes public. No idea when it will be released, although at a guess I'd expect it to be the new version for the Ryzen 9 3950X. Speaking of the 3950X, a few people have asked us whether we have any information on when it is coming, but yeah, as of right now, still really no information, no firm confirmation, no review samples, don't have any firm launch dates or anything like that. So if you're hoping for review data and a launch in the first week of November, probably pretty unlikely at this point. Gigabyte have teased an upcoming TRX40 motherboard on their social media page. As spotted by video cards, uh, the board is quite clearly an AMD HEDT platform with a socket that looks pretty similar to existing TR4 sockets. The leading theory right now is this is actually a new socket which will break backwards compatibility with older Threadripper CPUs and will mean Threadripper 3000 won't work on older boards, but that hasn't been confirmed yet. This is a large extended ATX board similar to the X399 Aorus Extreme with 8 DDR4 slots and 4 PCIe 4.0 slots. We expect 3rd gen Threadripper to be just 4 channels as opposed to 8 on Epic at least for some models. Perhaps that will differ with the rumored TRX80 platform as well. TRX40 and Threadripper 3000 are supposedly going to be announced on November 5th as we discussed in last week's news corner for a mid-November release. It seems like most weeks TSMC are getting in the news cycle with updates about their next generation nodes. Pretty clever marketing from them, I guess. And they are growing to be one of the biggest companies in the computing business, so maybe it's not all that surprising we get a lot of news. This week, we have news on TSMC's 5 nanometer or N5 manufacturing tech. High volume manufacturing for these parts is expected to start in the second quarter of 2020, and production will ramp up faster than occurred for 7 nanometers, which is a bit exciting. 5 nanometer, of course, uses EUV tools with more layers than any of their previous designs, allowing for smaller transistors, better power, and better performance, all the things we like to see from a new node. It succeeds 7 nanometer plus or N7 plus, which is currently in volume production, a year after 7 nanometer begun shipping. So of course, each year we're getting new process technologies and various optimizations. There's also 6 nanometer tech out there, and that is on track, I believe, at the moment. A bit different to 7 nanometer plus, but 5 nanometer is set to be better than either. The typical timeline for these developments would see 5 nanometer products, at least for PC, CPUs, and GPUs, and of course that's what we're interested in here, probably at the very end of 2020 at the earliest, if not much more likely to be in 2021, with mobile SOCs and so on coming before then. AMD Zen 3, for example, we expect will be a 2020 release on 7 nanometer plus, so there's always a bit of a delay for this high performance stuff between high volume manufacturing and usage, but still exciting times. Here's another story from Computerbase. According to their monitoring of the EU market, current generation Intel Skylake X processors are set to receive a massive price reduction as Intel introduces Cascade Lake X onto the market. These chips could have their prices slashed by up to 50%, although as of right now, Intel's official price list does not contain any price cuts for these chips. The reason why Skylake X will almost certainly receive a price cut is the new pricing structure for Cascade Lake X. Intel's new generation of HDT chips, which 
which are set to launch next month, bring significantly reduced prices per core than Skylake X. The 18 core model, for example, used to cost nearly $2,000, but will instead be priced at below $1,000 with this new generation, bringing Intel pricing back to the position it was in a few years ago. If there is a new Cascade Lake X 18 core on the market for $1,000 or so, there is no chance that an older Skylake X model with the same core count at nearly $2,000 would sell, leaving retailers stuck with expensive and immovable CPUs. So a price cut is pretty much inevitable to clear out that stock, as computer-based belief is already starting to happen. So far, we haven't seen any price cuts as of yet, but if we do, we will let you know, so you can go and buy one if you're interested. There are two new players in the monitor market this week, Razer and Xiaomi. Somehow these companies felt now was the perfect time to enter an already crowded market teeming with competition, but you know, whatever, I guess I don't make these decisions. Let's talk about Razer's monitor first. Pretty cool and unique design if I'm honest for their Raptor 27. This was first announced at CES and it's finally gone on sale. 27 inch, 2560 by 1440 IPS panel with a maximum refresh rate of 144 Hz and response times listed between one and seven milliseconds. It's also a fake HDR monitor with display HDR 400 certification. Razer has gone with that useless spec for advertising reasons, but there's no local dimming, so it won't provide a meaningful upgrade over an SDR experience. It's also FreeSync certified and G-Sync compatible, so it'll work with adaptive sync on any recent AMD or Nvidia GPUs. Likely low frame rate compensation here as well, given every 144 Hz or above monitor supports this as far as I'm aware. The kicker here though is the price, which is $699. That's pretty expensive for a 1440p 144Hz IPS display. One of my favorites at the moment is the LG 27GL850, which is a $500 monitor if you can find one in stock, but there are plenty of other sub $700 offerings too, like the ASUS PG279Q. Razer would want the Raptor 27 to be very, very good at that price, but I doubt it'll match the 27GL850. Hopefully I'll be able to get one into review in the next few weeks or so, depending on Australian releases, which can be a little different. The other release is the Xiaomi Mi Surface Display. Uh, yeah, I guess that's what they've ended up calling it. It's a 34 inch 3440 by 1440 monitor at 144 Hz, so an ultra wide of course, and it uses a curved VA panel with FreeSync support and 121% coverage of sRGB. It's gone on sale in China already for about 310 US dollars when you do the conversions, which makes it very cheap for that hardware, but who knows whether it will ever be sold uh, in Western markets. Team Group have launched 32 gig DIMMs, at least according to their latest product catalog as spotted by prolific Twitter searcher Momomo. But before you get excited about high capacity DDR4 DIMMs for your high performance PC, Team Group's 32 gig DDR4 offerings aren't exactly speed demons. The kits available as either a single stick or a 64 gig dual DIMM kit come both with just DDR4 2666 CL19 speeds using unknown memory modules. This is going to be great for OEMs, which often stick to default DDR4 speeds, especially for workstation products, but let's be honest, no one is using DDR4 2666 for their gaming machines where possible, especially if large amounts of RAM are also a requirement. There's also no heat spreader on these DIMMs, so it's a very basic package overall. No word on pricing, although these kits should be available at least in Japan starting today. And if these do interest you, make sure to check compatibility with your motherboard as not all products support high capacity DIMMs like this. That's it for this week's News Corner. You know the drill. We do these every week, so it's probably worth subscribing for a news recap or for any of the other cool content we make weekly. Consider supporting us on Patreon or through the merch store. You can see I'm wearing a t-shirt today because it's going to be pretty warm. I'm excited to get back to my cool office to go edit this video. I guess that's it. I'll catch you in the next one.